this is not Airbnb bust. It's a buzzword. That means we've got 10,000 properties, uh, 10,000 listings that are currently going through our, our system. We've just done <laughs> 50 million pounds in tracked direct bookings. Is Airbnb dead? Today, I'm interviewing Mark Simpson, who is the founder and CEO of Boostly, a direct booking platform. And he sees all the data for over 2,500 operators, 10,000 listings, and his platform generated over 50 million pounds because he's based in the UK. And so we're going to talk about is Airbnb dead in 2024 and what operators can do to make sure that their business doesn't die out? It's all coming up next. So, Mark, thank you so much for jumping on the show today. Uh, my pleasure. We've finally made it. We finally made it happen. <laughs> it's been a year of, hey, let me get you on the podcast. And I don't know if it's just all the different speaking stuff that you've done this year, but also just the rise of direct bookings. I was like, I need to get Mark on to talk about what he's doing to help out some short-term rental operators. So Mark, with that being said, what the heck do you do? So my elevator pitch, I guess you'd call it, is I help short-term rental owners, whether it's in the short-term rental or medium-term rental, I, I help basically give them the tools, the tactics, and the, and, and the training to go and increase their direct bookings. And we do that through uh, many different avenues. One of them is websites. One of them is coaching, masterminds, et cetera. And then we've also got books, loads of education as well. So yeah, it's I've been doing this for seven years now but i've been in the world of hospitality since since i was born really i, I was born into hospitality grew up in hospitality tried to escape it but it dragged me straight back <laughs> and then yeah since 2011 i've been in it full time but yeah it's been a it's been a heck of a ride so everything that's going on today obviously you have your software platform and your agency that you run but what else is going on so we we're basically what we're we've literally just passed 50 members of staff at boostly Oh, wow. which is a crazy achievement. Like I say, when I started in 2016, it was just me behind my kitchen table where we used to live. We were renting a place and I never would have thought if you were to say, Hey, seven years time, you'll have 50 members of staff, 50 team members. I'd be like, nah, <laughs> but it has grown so much. And the awareness of direct bookings has grown and the need for independence, business independence has grown so much. And yeah, it's, it has literally ballooned. And literally two weeks ago, I hired a, a managing director. Uh, so we got our MD come on board. Uh, I realized as we were growing that I needed to educate myself for the next step. And I, I don't know if you've ever read the books, but Traction by Gino Wickman. It had I read it in, in September. I put it on an Audible. I got a little baby girl. She needed a, a car ride to get her to sleep, as you do. And I literally ended up driving for three hours. And I, I'm one of those guys that listens to audiobooks on like speed 1.5. <laughs> yeah. I absolutely nailed it through. And after reading that book, I messaged all of the leaders, the leadership team saying, listen or read this book asap we need to implement this in the business and the book is all about loads of different things that it talks about but one of them is there's, there's visionaries and there's in, integrators right mm -hmm. so basically people do the work and i realized that i'm the visionary i need to be the visionary i was a founder now i'm a visionary and i need an integrator and uh, yes yeah, so we just brought in the managing director and it's been one of the best decisions I think I've ever done it has meant that I've just been able to let go of so much of the day to day and I can just focus on being the visionary, taking the business forward and doing more for direct bookings, which has freed up my time to be able to do this podcast, which is really cool. <laughs> I appreciate you jumping on. I know that you're in the UK and it's, you know, past bedtime for the kids. I'm sure it's time to wind down, but congratulations on 50 employees. And then how many short term rental operators would you say that you've now helped? Yeah. So client wise, we've got just around averaging about 2,500. That means we've got 10,000 properties, uh, 10,000 listings that are currently going through our, our system. Literally, we're, we're just about to go to press on this. So you get the exclusive. We've just done yeah. 50 million pounds in tracked direct bookings via our, our services, our website, which is epic. So what about 60 million USD in 2023, which is really cool. But yeah, we're making an impact. Like I say, it started off with just five people way back when, and now yeah. it really has ramped up over the last few years. Okay, so in today's episode, I want to talk all about why direct bookings are important, how owners can implement them, and what are the best tips, hopefully, that we can all generate more revenue. Yeah. One thing that I've been seeing on YouTube all the time is this doom and gloom. You see an uh, Airbnb is dead. There's fire behind the YouTuber pointing. Yeah. The world is falling. Is that true? What's your hot take on that? 
for a lot of people who have got into the short-term rental game since 2020, which is when it had a massive pivot and a massive boom, for a lot of you, it will feel like Airbnb bust. But for those who have been around for a while, this is not Airbnb bust. It's a buzzword. As we like to call it in the UK, we call it buzzword bingo. And what it is our industry going back to norm? This is not just me saying this. This is like actual experts. This is their DNA. This is key data. This is, these are the people that have got access to all of the data. And what's happening is that we are going back to 2018, 2019 levels, which is the norm. 2020, 2021, and to an extent, 2022, there was a massive spike because of obviously everything that went on at the start of this decade. People couldn't go on cruises. They couldn't stay in hotels, but they still wanted to go away. Government gave them a lot of money, so they had an additional revenue. And so people like to get away. People like to vacation. And obviously in America, there was different states, different rules, et cetera, on what you could do, et cetera. But people were still going away. Even if they were getting in the car and driving 30 minutes, they were wanting to experience something new, especially with the whole work from home thing. And because of that, short-term rentals absolutely ballooned. The prices per stay ballooned. Profits were great. And everybody who was in the long-term rentals was looking at short-term rentals going, I want a piece of that pie. And with a lack of regulations, with a lack of legislations and a lack of rules, anybody could do it. There was literally nothing stopping them. Obviously now, 2023, the international borders have opened. Americans are traveling abroad more than ever. Cancun and London have been the main places this year that they've gone to. And because of that, in America in particular, a lot of people who have come into this world have gone, Where, where's everybody gone? <laughs> and because there's so much choice. Uh, but to, to basically a long way around of answering that question, it's not Airbnb bus. We've just gone back to 2018 levels. Fair. I mean, there's travel trends have changed a little bit. And obviously, as markets have now caught up, there is a little bit of shakeup with the regulations, like you said, which is obviously now why people are looking at different alternatives, say midterm rentals, then had a crazy spike last year. And then, of course, I think direct bookings goes alongside with it because now people are like, how the heck do we get these? Yeah. So where is the turning point now? How can someone now implement direct bookings and why should they implement direct bookings? The turning point, I think this is my big prediction for 2024. And we are very lucky in this industry. So hospitality industry, and I class everybody in the world who is in hospitality. You're not a real estate investor, you're not whatever, you're in hospitality. That is the world you're in. And the big prediction for next year is that everybody is going to need to have a diverse marketing strategy. And I'll come on to that in a second. So the reason why we're very lucky is that up until now, you could uh, start a business today. So I could open up Mark B&B, right? I could uh, go and take a couple of pictures. I could take my property, whack those pictures up on one, two or three websites, Airbnb, Verbo, Booking.com, and let's just say Airbnb. And I'll be pretty much guaranteed revenue to come in. The reason why is that we're in an industry of making memories, right? Everybody loves to go on vacation, whether it's a staycation or whatever. And so because of that, it's, it is in demand, really in demand. Like Airbnb have about 3 million bookings that happen every single day on their platform. It is bananas, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so when it comes to marketing your property and when you're starting in a business, if you can just put that market in a property thing on a plate and it's a plate that's spinning alongside every other plate that you've got to juggle at the same time. If you can just go, right, that plate there, that's sorted by Airbnb. Fantastic. I'll leave it. But it's a blessing, but it's also a curse because the, the curse is that you become so reliant on this one plate being spun by one channel. What happens if it stops spinning? What happens if you stop getting revenue in? And that is what's happening right now. And this is why, like you said, direct bookings are on the rise because people are like, I cannot build my business. I cannot build my career. I cannot build my, my future on one platform. I cannot build my house on their land. And what they're doing is, right, what's this thing called Verbo? <laughs> what's this thing called Booking.com? What's this thing called Furnish Finder? What's this? What's X? What's Y? What's Z? And they're going, I, I need to be on here. And they're going to go and list on all these places. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, okay, but how do I make sure I don't get a double booking? It's one of the biggest questions that I get when I come over to America. It's about the double bookings. And the simple solution to that is you go and get a property management software tool otherwise known as a PMS. Now, the problem for everybody, and 
everybody who has been down this solution will uh, know this problem. And anybody who's in a Facebook group for, for real estate or short term rentals, you'll know this problem is that there are over 1,100 different providers in the world for property management software. There's not just one company that everybody goes to. So there's a lot of choice. But the cool thing is that we put together a little blog post. We interviewed 100 owners and we interviewed them about the pros and cons of each property management software tool and we put it up on our blog. So go check it out uh, and I'll give you the link after, but it's B O O S T L Y dot co dot UK forward slash P N S P for Peter M for mother S for sugar. Go to that blog, go check it out. And we've got the best of the best on there and you can go make your own decision. But when you've got a PMS, your life is so much easier because then you can use that as your central hub. Instead of going into Airbnb every day, you're going to your PMS every day and then you'll connect that to Airbnb, you'll connect yeah. that to Verbo, you'll connect that to booking.com, so you'll never get a double booking. Also on the back of that, you can connect it to a payment provider, so you can take direct payments, you can connect it to a, a direct booking website, and there's all other cool things you can do connected to Breezeway, which is gonna help with your operations, and all those other cool things as well. So that is the central hub. And so that is why it's really important next year, you go and make sure that you've got a, a real diverse marketing strategy. So you're not just putting it on one place, you spread it out all over. And obviously as well, on the back of that, you've got to make sure that direct bookings are a key part of what you're doing as well. And your PMS may not necessarily be your direct booking engine. Obviously your team produces one. And how can then someone, say they use you or anybody else, hopefully they use you, <laughs> can someone actually get leads to their direct booking website because Airbnb will send you traffic. What are then you advising your clients to try and pick up that traffic? Yeah, hundred percent. So once you've got a direct booking website, it doesn't matter whether you use Boostly or you do it yourself or you go down another route. When you've got a website, what the, the big problem that most website designers make is they just hand you a website and go all the best. This is why I am so adamant about this is that if you are going to work with a website designer, you've got to work with a company that is an expert in their field. Mm -hmm. We don't do websites for personal trainers. We don't do websites for barbershops or car dealerships or e-commerce. We just do websites for the world of hospitality because we know exactly how a website is meant to be structured and layer out to turn a looker to a booker. But the other big problem is that when a host gets a website from somebody else, they go, brilliant. Now what, <laughs> how do I get traffic to this? So the first thing that we did, um, here called the book direct playbook this has got 101 tactics on how to drive traffic to your website and how to increase bookings it literally is available on amazon it's like a dollar right for the kindle version so you can go and grab that wait mark can i pause you there yeah out of that book which one's your favorite of all time which one of the tips yeah so the the, the main tip i talk about and it's the one at the very start it's all about knowing your avatar Right. Okay. Basically, that avatars fancy marketing spiel for knowing your ideal guest. Mm -hmm. This is a big problem that so many people make is they'll open up a property and I can see them in the Facebook groups and they're going, I've got no bookings. And I'll just ask them a super quick question in the comments. Who's your ideal guest? Who's your avatar? And they'll go, anybody's going to give me money. And that is such the wrong answer because when you appeal, try and appeal to everybody, you appeal to nobody. Mm -hmm. So the book teaches you, okay, who is your ideal guest based on your location, based on where your property is and who is coming to your area. And it, that is probably the key thing because when you nail that, when you get that correct, your whole life becomes easier because you'll know exactly how to describe it. You'll know exactly who to market it to. Your pictures on Airbnb will be a lot more clearer as well because you can structure them to speak to your ideal guest. And as well, when you add to your portfolio and your property in the future, you will have a property avatar as well. So the next property that you'll bring in, you'll go, oh, so does this match up to the same avatar as property one? Because then you'll start to build a brand around it. And there's a real cool example of this in Columbus, Ohio, a Boostly client, they're called Jungle House. Okay. Okay, junglehouse.org is the domain. And all of their properties has got the fake IKEA plants. And it is so branded around that jungle theme, right? Because they've got the they've got the fake plants. Obviously, the colors, all the colors that you can imagine a jungle theme being, they've got. And they're building that brand around that. And that's what all of the properties have that same vibe and feeling. And they do so well. So yeah, there you go, jungle house. Brilliant. So yeah, they've got the plants, they've got the coloring, they've got the branding, and it's all I say very clear. So when a guest comes and stays with one of those properties, they know exactly what they're getting. 
which is epic, which is if you bring it back to what the hotels do really well, if you think about the Hiltons, the Marriott's, what do they do really well? Every time you walk into one of those properties, what you're going to get, right? Exactly the type of bed, exactly the, where, where the table is, exactly where X, Y, and Z is. And that's the same vibe that, that when you do this correctly, like Jungle House does, it's the same vibe that you're going to get throughout. So how long does it take for one of your clients to build a site like this out? We build it all for them. So basically what we do is we have an onboarding call. So if okay. you were to sign up, we have an onboarding call, you get a personal project manager. The onboarding call lasts about an hour. We ask a couple of questions, we get a couple of things, and then we go ahead and build out your wireframe for you. That wireframe, that framework takes about four to six weeks, depending on the amount of information that we have. And then after that four to six weeks, we then have another Zoom call to go over changes. And then from there on in, it can take another four to six weeks to uh, go live. We like to try and make this process as hands-off as possible uh, for you as the host, because obviously we know you're busy hospitality owners. But in the same time, as we're building the work, the cool thing is that we plug you straight into our coaching, we plug you straight into our mastermind so that you can start to actually ramp up your education and your marketing training. So when the website is live, you can just launch it and go full in. We also give you access to a, a CRM as well. So a Boostly CRM, which okay. is a CRM is where you build your email list. It's also got a social media scheduler built into it. So yeah, we really do give you all the tools. Again, tools and tactics and training is like the key philosophy about what we do and the tools that what we know to be true is website and obviously building that email list. Help me convince some more owners to go direct and maybe even myself, because we haven't done it that much either. How much more money can you make by adding in a direct booking system? Let's just say that 100% of your bookings are coming from Airbnb. And let's mm -hmm. just assume that you're on the 3% commission model. The worrying news for everybody is that in my prediction, and again, this may not come true, but I can see the writing on the wall, is that next year or the year after, they're going to scrap that 3% commission model. They're going to scrap the guest service charge, and they're going to put everyone on a flat rate of 14%. Okay. When that happens, your P&Ls, especially if you're doing the management model or mm -hmm. the arbitrage model, is going to massively take a hit. So instantly, what you can do is you'll be making, let's just say you are going to take out strike fees, et cetera, an extra 10% extra per booking. Now over a singularity, that may not make a lot of difference, but over a year, that will make a massive hit on the PL. But when it comes to it, and when it really boils down to it, it's not about the money. It's about the control. Every booking that you get direct is on your terms, mm -hmm. it's your policies, and you haven't got a big buffer overlooking your shoulder because you, we all know what that means is that if a booking comes in from an OTA platform, guest arrives, guest complains, they instantly have you bent over a barrel because every single Airbnb host is so protective of their guest favorite or super host badge. And they know the get the guest knows, all right, the guests are smart now, but if they complain and if you get a crappy review, then you potentially will lose your super host badge and that's what all super hosts don't want to do. This is where Airbnb are so good at what they do. And when it's your own booking on your own rules, you are not pandering to a big brother. It is literally your rules, it, your database as well. So you get the email address, you get the phone number, so you can do all of the remarketing down the line. We, as our family business, where I grew up in, we always average between 70% and 80% direct bookings over every single year, right? Wow. And that means 20% was coming from third parties. The mm -hmm. third parties was Airbnb, booking.com. And Verbo wasn't even a thing then. This is the Expedia group. And we did that by consistently building our list, building our database. And we also as well made sure that every single guest was educated in why they should book direct and not via one of these third party platforms. Obviously, not everyone is going to do it. That's fine. But if we could get the majority, we always had that control. And when you've got the control in your business, you have the confidence. Next question. Is this a myth or not? But is direct is building out a direct systems or direct booking system, is that for every size operator or is there a certain scale where you should be now thinking about this? Everybody can do it. And it doesn't matter whether you're at property one, property two, or property a hundred. But the whole thing is where the question you've got to ask yourself is where does this fit in your priorities? If this short-term rental that you have or this airbnb whatever you want to call it is it a third or fourth priority in your life do you have two careers do you have other projects etc if it is just one of those things that if it works great if it doesn't oh then 
you don't need to listen to any of this. You can just keep on what you're doing or go and hire a property management company to do it for you, right? Yeah. If this is you, if this is your business, and I would like to think if you're watching this podcast, you're listening to this podcast, you're in those top 5%, because I say this a lot, there are 7 million listings on Airbnb. I truly believe that there are only 350,000 of those listings that are actually any good, the top 5%. Everybody else is crap. And I like to think that top 5% are the ones that listen to podcasts. They they uh, go to masterminds, they go to events, they're part of coaching groups, right? And if you're part of that, then yes, you have to do this sooner rather than later because mm -hmm. it's a lot easier to do it at property number one than it is at property number 40. I'm helping somebody that's 40 properties in and they've never done any direct bookings and they've got so much of a spider's web to try and untangle. It is a lot trickier to try and implement. I'm speaking to somebody who's got over a hundred doors and they have built everything on Airbnb land. And it is very tricky to like implement it for them. The reason why we work really well with property owners from one to 20 is because we can make the biggest impact and we can actually lay that solid foundation, which is what my second book was all about, the book Diet Blueprint. It's about laying that solid foundation so that you can actually build it, grow it and scale it. So to answer your question, you should be doing it every single level, whether it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But it's all about where this all fits into your mindset and your your preference of, of like you know, revenue streams. Yeah. Go well, an extra bottle. And this is basically I'm sure this is just answering your FAQ page at this point. <laughs> How are owners protected? Obviously, with Airbnb, you have air cover. What happens with direct booking? Yeah, now this the, the first question that I said was the most common one, which is about the avatar, etc. The second one is this one. It's listen, air cover. And I want everybody to realize that air cover is just marketing. That is all it is. And I believe that if Airbnb are world-class at anything, it's their marketing, their branding team. They are phenomenal. We don't get enough credit for it. And that is all air cover is. There are so many solutions out there that are off platform, as in off Airbnb, that give you better coverage. Okay. There's a company called Superhog, S-U-P-E-R-H-O-G.com. And they cover you up to $5 million of breakages. Okay. And I feel like it comes down to you don't know what you don't know, right? And everybody who just lists their property on Airbnb, you do so because you feel that nice little cushy blanket of, oh, it's okay because if something goes wrong, air cover. But if anybody has ever tried to claim something on air cover, you will know how hard it is. And there's actually some reports that are starting to come out, whether they're true or not, that the more that you claim on air cover, your actual listing on Airbnb is being penalized and being pushed down the ranking. Why? Because they say that why would Airbnb consistently want you to get bookings if you're putting in a load of air cover claims, right? It's just, it's one of those things that if you think about it from a realistic point of view, it makes a ton of sense. And again, it comes back to what I said before, is you've got to take as much as possible off these platforms and you've got to put it in your own world. And coverage, super hog, insurance, guest protection, host protection is one of them because when you do this, and you've got to put a cover through, you've got a third party that's looking at it. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, air cover is there to protect one person and one person only, and that's Airbnb. Nobody in their right mind would trust their dynamic pricing software tool. Nobody who is actually knowledgeable, right? The smart pricing that Airbnb offer you is the same as booking.com and Verbo. It's there to, to benefit them. Everybody uses Price Labs because Price Labs are the go-to. Everybody has heard of Wheelhouse, they've heard of Beyond Pricing, they've heard of AirDNA, because that's what they use. And it's mm -hmm. the that same thing with the coverage. That's, I'll have to take out a soup pod, because that sounds like a awesome extra coverage. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're convincing me, and hopefully you're convincing the audience. And the, the other piece that I want is we've talked about why Airbnb is dying, and why you shouldn't have all those eggs in one basket. We've talked about the coverage and the other things. The other thing is I want, aside from the avatar, what is one way that people can generate traffic to their direct booking site? So the thing that we used to do every year, I'm seeing that we're recording this at the end of 2023, which is a real good time to do this, is we would, every year, we would create a, a list of everybody who has stayed with us that past year. We'd do this in November, right? And when we collect the data, we would get email address, but we'd also get a postal address. And so in November, and bearing in mind at this point, we'd have thousands of people, we would get 
um, a massive box of Christmas cards, right? And we would write to our guests and we would send them a Christmas card. We'd spend the whole of November writing them and then we'd post them on the 25th, the 26th, the 27th of November. And th those dates are key. Now, the reason why we did this from a marketing point of view is that everybody now, and bear in mind, we were doing this in 2015, 2016, 2017. At that time, and even now, people like to send a DM. They like to send a, a, do a comment, or it's all online, right? They'll send a voice note before they even want to pick up the phone. And I'm a big believer when everybody zigs, you want to zag. And what did we used to do? We used to put messages through the post, right? And there's nothing better than getting a, a nice envelope through the post. And especially if it's a Christmas card. And the reason why we posted it on the 26th, the 27th, or the 25th of November, is that it will arrive at the very end of November slash the start of December. You are the first Christmas card that is through the mail, right? And you never want to be the last Christmas card. You never want to be the 20th of December when everybody's got all of these. And it's just like, oh, yeah, brilliant, Timmy, boom. But if it's the first one, it means the world. And what we would do on that Christmas card would, it would include a little coupon that would have an expiry date on it, i.e. the 30th of January, where if they booked their stay for the next year now, then they would get either a, a discount or they would get two nights for the price of one or whatever offer we were wanting to put out. And this is massive because the first seven days of January from the test of, from the start of time have been the busiest travel dates ever. There's, I think it's the 16th of January, which is officially the most busiest travel day in the calendar because people like to book their vacation. They like to book their staycation. They wake up on the 2nd of January, they've shaken off the hangover and they're like, what are we doing this year? And we would have the Christmas card with the little coupon that they've stuck on the fridge and they're like, we want to go there. We want to go back there. We want to go have another amazing experience because we're in the, we're in the industry of making memories. We want to have amazing memories going back there. And they've got the coupon. And so they would come onto the website or they'd give us a call or they would email us and they would book their stay and they would get their, they would get their offer. But for us, we would get a good solid 30% of our annual income on those first two weeks of January. Wow. And the cool thing is about when a guest pays books direct, you get the money up front. You don't have to wait 28 days or whatever. They just, you get the money there and then. So we could really proactively budget for our whole year of marketing spend. And we would probably spend about, about four or 5,000 uh, pounds doing that marketing activity. But the return of investment was huge. We would get about 300% uh, return of investment easy every year. And it only got better the more amount of data that, that we got. And that is one of the surefire ways of doing so. 100% building that database, utilizing that database and just telling them where to go. Dude, that is a solid tip. I don't even get Christmas cards from the major hotels that I visited. So let alone if you have a really boutique, fun, beautiful, short-term rental company who's going to send that to you to inspire mm -hmm. vacations. And it's personalized. It's handwritten. Right. It means something. And again, everybody this week, obviously recording this of the week of when it's Black Friday, right? And on Friday, we know what's going to be, the state of our inbox is going to be insane. I call it the, the, the day that I, I unsubscribe from so many emails, right? Because everybody goes down the same route of just taking it unpersonalized and they'll just dump it in your inbox and we'll see what happens, right? But if you just take a, a minute to step, step back and sometimes mm -hmm. you've got to do things that don't scale. And this is one of the things that like we talk about Airbnb and their story. One of the things I love the Airbnb story. I'm a massive fan of the founding story and everything. As much as like I talk about direct bookings, I'm a huge fan of Airbnb and what they've created. I think it's phenomenal. And one of the things that they did really is that they do things that don't scale. When Brian and when Joe and Nate were doing Y Combinator, they realized that a lot of their hosts were in New York. And so Paul Graham, the founder of Y Combinator at the time, he said, go to New York. And they did. And what they did is they went and interviewed and stayed with and visited all of the hosts that are in New York and they were taking professional photographs. And this is when the company was growing and growing fast. And they did that because they realized that by doing so, they will build that community, right? And it's a phenomenal story. And it's one that every business owner can take care of because what we want to do, and we're, we're all guilty of it, we want to grow a business, but we want it to be passive income. And we want just everything to be automated. And we don't have to talk to anybody. And we want to do that. But sometimes it's the things that 
you can do in your business, whatever you're doing, whether you're listening to this and you're a hospitality host or you're a vendor or a service provider or what, think about the things that you can do that aren't scalable, that will provide a massive amount of community building to turn your customers into super fans. Because when you've got super fans, you know, anybody who's read that Pat Flynn book or that Kevin Kelly blog, A Thousand True Fans, they will become your marketing machine for you. So you won't even have to worry about SEO. You don't have to worry about Facebook ads. You won't have to worry about any of it because all of your guests are telling all of their circles and friends and social media people about you. That doing things that don't scale is not easy to do, but the results are definitely worth it. And I'm sure no one has ever done something and gone over the top and says, man, maybe <sighs> I should not have done that, right? Usually yeah. there's some good that comes out of it no matter what. Mark, okay, next, this is actually the last kind of prediction question I got for you. And then I want to switch gears maybe to the marketing side a little bit. But because you see over 10,000 listings, thousands of operators, you gave your prediction in terms of the Airbnb changes. But what about in terms of the real estate market as a whole? Where are you looking that people should be looking at buying? What's your prediction for the market? Buying, I don't know. You need to ask AirDNA about that. I mean, no, it was Jamie Lane. Good friend, Jamie Lane, he's, he's on the ball with that. Make sure you check out when it comes onto the Bigger Pockets podcast or any podcast that he has. Now, he's, his data source is fantastic for that. But my prediction for next year is there's going to be a lot of regulations. There are going to be a lot of people are going to shake the bad actors out. And a lot of people are going to get caught up on this. All we ask for as an industry is we want fair regulation because it is yeah. so easy. The higher this gets um, pushed up the chain, in these decision-making offices, there's going to be people that will just attach their agenda on to this thing. So the, the, the main agenda is fair regulation, right? And that will get pushed up for something that's going to happen, whether it's in a statewide, city-wide, nationwide, wherever we are. Obviously, America and Canada work differently to the UK. But as it goes up the chain, it's so easy for other people in other offices to like bolt on their agenda, the things they're trying to get pushed through. And when that happens, that's when unfair regulation comes in. And that is what, unfortunately, so many people are finding out at the moment. And regulation on a ground level, common sense, fair regulation is just makes a ton of sense. Because at the moment, you can go, depending on where you are in the world, you could literally take a property, you can do it, rent it off a landlord, you can go and take a couple of pictures without any health and safety checks, get it listed online, and you could have guests staying there two days later, right? That yeah. is not safe, right? Especially seeing that we are dealing with families, young children, etc. So if something has to happen there. But the problem is, <laughs> with anything, and we've seen it massively over the last four years, is that nobody has the confidence that the people at the top to make sure that it is fair regulation coming in. So you've just got to be aware. You've got to make sure that you are in a pivotable model. And the MTR strategy, shout out to Jesse Vasquez, shout out to all the cool people, Ruben and Dr. Rachel Gainsbury and et cetera, who are like really building a huge community about the medium term rental strategy. That is the one that's currently winning. Depends on where you are. And in the UK, we don't call it MTR. We don't call it STR. We, we, we don't have a lot of these buzzword bingo words. It's just a contract to stay or, 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 or a long booking, basically. But it is becoming more and more powerful and popular. So my one advice would be stay on top of your local regulations where your property are. I know it's a pain, but go yeah. be in the room, the Chamber of Commerce, be in these meetings, find out what's going on. And by being in the room, you've got a more opportunity to help make sure that it is fair regulation. Number two is be ready to pivot if you need to. So have the model ready so you can pivot it to an MTR strategy, 30 day stay plus if you need to as well, because it could just literally happen like that. And we've seen it so much this year with certain cities, just bringing it down. Um, doesn't matter where you are in, in, in the USA, it could happen at any point at any time. I agree. Our first short term rental, we did it in Yucca Valley and we closed right before they had their whole restructure for permit laws. And so we were shut down for six months, eventually towards the end, put in a midterm rental. But now that the laws have been established, we have our permit officially locked in and we know exactly what the regulations are. There's none of that kind of question dangling over our head. So I totally agree that regulation is good. Yeah. It's sucky when you're going through it, though. That's for sure. Yeah, no, 100%. <laughs> 100%. All right, so look, you've dropped a lot of value for the operators now. And I just want to talk some things, whether it be business-wise or personal-wise, especially for me on the marketing side. I always like to see what marketing tactics are working for other entrepreneurs. Yeah. So for you, do you have a separate personal or business account? So the way that I treat it 
is I'm, I'm all for ease. I always look at everything like, how would this look if it was simple? Mm -hmm. and I have one Instagram account, but I like to mix it up between personal stuff and business stuff on there. I'm, I'm a massive believer on documenting. I've always done it. I, I think I watched far too many Gary Vee videos when I was starting Boothly in 2016. And he talked about document, document and I've always done it. Yeah. The type of content that I post on Instagram, is, well, in the actual feed itself, it will be mostly clips from the podcast. Maybe if I'm on speaking on stage, uh, I'll throw in like one or two things if something really monumental has happened on a personal point of view. But for the most part, the feed is that. The stories, however, is just free flow in there. I love to see like throwing things up, seeing what works, et cetera, and just seeing the people that follow and see it. I love that. Facebook uh, is 100 percent like the, the personal game i love doing that obviously putting about the work stuff that we're doing there is a business account but to be honest that the business account for facebook is linked up to the instagram i've got a team that run that and they will post stuff on there and it gets spread mm -hmm. around LinkedIn obviously is a lot more to my linkedin peeps i always say that i go to an influencer event if i want to follow grow my instagram followers but if i go to an industry event it's to grow my linkedin followers so the linkedin chat is more like what we're doing boostly from like a business level like 50 million uh, pounds in direct bookings hiring the md etc etc and then threads i do threads every now and again and i'll just post random stuff on there like things that thoughts have come to mind and etc I'll, I'll post it on there and see if it hits on there i don't really pay much attention to it i don't have the apps so my my, my one big hack actually is I've only got Instagram on, on here. I don't have any other social media. Interesting. And I have screen times set because otherwise I know what I'm like. I'd be sitting on there forever. So I have a 10-minute Instagram limit every single day. Once that 10 minutes is up, it locks me out. I can't go on it anymore. And there's no other social media on there. Obviously, when I'm at my computer, I technically am at work mode. Right? So when I'm at my computer at my desk, I will... I'll have Facebook open to check in the groups and LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. But for the most part, I, I, I try and keep it really at a low consumption for social media. But I'm a massive fan of answering the question is basically documenting the process because I can see right back to 2016 when this properly got going. And it's, there's nothing better than a memory popping up to say, this is what you were doing in 2016. It's what you're doing in 2017. And it's awesome to see. Yeah, that is a really easy time capsule. On the same line, I want to know now, and I'm going to ask this question in a specific way, because for me, I think that there's a difference between clips that can go viral versus clips that actually drive business. Over the past decade of you posting, what two clips, which one would you say has given you the most virality and which one has given you the most business? So virality, I like to do things, infotainment, we talked about this, right? Infotainment. So people, nobody remembers what you tell them, but everybody remembers how they made them feel. And when I go on stage, I take that as well. So when I'm speaking on stage, I'm not so much speaking to the people in the room. I'm speaking to the people on social media who are going to watch it back. And like a one hour talk, I try and pick out at least seven moments that will go clippable and variable. Mm -hmm. So for example, when I spoke at the STR Wealth event in Nashville this year, there was a thousand people in front of me and I got a friend of mine. I told him there was going to be a keyword when I was doing my speech and the keyword was Airbnb. And when he, he heard Airbnb, he was going to run up on stage and slap me and then shout, you keep my Airbnb out your effing mouth and then he runs off stage. Nobody knew it was coming. The guy that I was speaking on stage with definitely didn't know it was coming. And we clipped it and the camera guy, my video guy that I hired, he was at the perfect angle at the perfect time and it looked amazing. We clipped it and we did it and it, it went everywhere, like literally everywhere, which was cool. That's virality. <laughs> yeah, that is virality. It's, it's on the Instagram. I'll send it to you if I can find it. But yeah. The ones that generate the most business, and we do this uh, a lot on LinkedIn, but we also do it on our Facebook business page. Every single time one of our websites go live, and bearing in mind, we have 15 projects sign up every week. We have about 10 to 15 websites go live every week. Every time a website goes live, we post about it individually. So we say, this is the website that's gone live. And then what we have, is we've got a set template. So right now we've got, 2,500 clients, customers, 10,000 listings powered by Boostly. So far, we've generated 50 million pounds of diet bookings with an average return of investment for our customers, eight, 1,000 pounds, right? And we do that every single time. 
And those are the ones that people then click on it. They book a call and they go, oh, I've seen the post on LinkedIn, Facebook, et cetera. So those are the ones that generate the most amount of business and calls. Side note, the when we sign up somebody, we turn everybody into an influencer. So what we do is we have an email that goes out and we say, hey, do you know anyone? So we normally have this email go out every 30 days or every 60 days. And we've got the project managers. If we know, because we, we like to do surveys, mm -hmm. we do these surveys a lot. And when a survey comes back and we say, how happy are you with Boostly? If it's a four or a five out of five, the, the project manager will, will reach out to them and do the, do you know anyone email? And this is a key for everybody. And I recommend everybody do this. So basically what all you're saying is, hey, we know you're having a great time at Boostly. We know you're loving the service. Do you know anyone who is as cool as you who would benefit from our services? If you do, please spread this email, share it with a peer, a mastermind group, Facebook or whatever. And if they sign up to Boostly and mention you, then you will get X. And X could be anything. I could send them a gift in the post. We could give them cold, hard cash. We can give them airline vouchers or whatever it is, but it's our way of saying thank you to, to recommending them. And those are the times when we truly generate calls because people, mm -hmm. if they're having a great time, they will tell people about it. The, 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 the rule of average is if they're having an amazing time, they'll tell two people. If they're having a shitty time, they'll tell nine people, <laughs> right? So we're not focusing on the nine and the crappy experiences, but we're focusing on the two that are having a great experience because if that one person can bring two back, that's phenomenal growth. And that is one of the true key factors about why we have grown so quickly over the last seven years is that we've built a community of super fans a community, we call them hashtag team Boostly members, right? And those are the ones that talk about us in Facebook groups. Those are the ones that talk about us in the friend group, in their network groups, their mastermind groups. And those are the posts that truly drive the business our way. Yeah, I agree. The virality is fun, but especially if you're talking about entertainment, sometimes it's just good for a nice chuckle. But I always find that if you are talking about your results consistently, that's what's actually going to drive business for you. Otherwise, it's cute and funny and yeah media exposure but the way that i do social media is i create everything for me i don't i'm not i know there's people out there that that will literally study like mr beast mr beast got so so good because he, he spent 12 hours a day with a group of friends looking at every single youtube video they reviewed it they see exactly what went clickable then all of that stuff i ain't got that time i just want to create content that i feel that i would like to watch and that will be documenting the process something that i can show my kids when they get older and they're going to like it and if people like that post great and i've always been a believer of your vibe attracts your tribe and if somebody likes it and comments it and remembers it and they and, and for whatever reason they end up becoming a member of boostly great but i'm not going to pander to the trends that are out there at the moment i'm not going to say something controversial or do a clickbaity post that's going to get somebody annoyed because that's what the social media wants you to do and if that means that a post is going to get like cricket so be it i don't care i don't look at them it's fun if one goes mega viral and you can see like all these cool things that are going on and your follow thing goes up, but that's just vanity metrics. Vanity likes and follows don't pay my mortgage. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I do it and I love it. And I'm a content creator first. I love creating content more than anything, but I do it for me. I don't do it for anyone else. I love that philosophy. And sometimes you just have to make silly videos just for your own creative outlet too, because talking yeah. about here's how much revenue I generated is not that much fun. And you still want to be a person, especially if it's on a personal page. Yeah. Yeah. It all depends on your selling style, but my, my, my way that I've always done it is the vibe attraction tribe. I, I, I will never forcibly sell anything. If you're ready, fantastic. Yeah. If you're not ready now, that's cool. Come back another time. I'm not going anywhere. We are literally just getting started. We've got 2,500 members and we are just getting started. If we're going to achieve our ultimate goal, which is to get the attention of the OTAs about book direct. So yeah, we're just it. getting to him. Yeah. That quote, Mark reminds me of one of my favorite quotes of all time by Ryan Serhant in his sales book, where he says that no one wants to be sold to, but everyone wants to go shopping with friends. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Last question on the last call. This one's totally switching gears, but it throws some people on a loop. I want you to tell me about what was the most memorable drink you've ever had? Who was it with and what made it so memorable? Okay. So the first thing that comes to mind is last week I was introduced to a, a drink called the Mexican mule. It was tequila with a bit of ginger ale. And it was lovely because I needed that drink at the right time because I was hosting my first ever big event 
called The Big Bash. My MD brought it over to me and it was lovely. It helped me calm my nerves. But my favorite ever drink, and this was when I used to live in America. So mm -hmm. I used to coach soccer. When I tried to escape from the world of hospitality, I moved to America. I was doing soccer coaching. I was in California. I was in San Diego. And we basically, we got paid nothing. We barely had any money at the end of the week for a, a Big Mac, never mind for a night out. But at the end of the week, we loved going on a night out in San Diego, down in the gas lamp area. And we were, we were in the bar and we're, we're, I could, in the corner of my eye on the floor, I thought I saw like a $10 note just lying there. So I put my foot on it. I reached down, I picked it up and I, and I nudged my mate. I said, hey, I've got a drink here. I opened it up. It was a hundred dollar note. I was like, amazing. Went straight to the bar. We bought 10 Long Island iced teas, shared it around, got very drunk. Can't remember the rest of the night from there on in, but I, I've never forgotten that moment. And that is now 23 years old, <laughs> that moment in my time. Uh, but yeah, that was one of, that's one of those stories that, that will always remember me. I will remember it to a point, but it was a very cool moment. You got to buy your buddies around, which when I was in my early 20s, I did not have the money to buy my buddies around. So I totally get the feeling of it and why it makes it so fun. Yeah, man. I love it. Okay, so Mark, what are you working on now? Okay, so right now, so we've just done our first of event, which was cool. We did that in the UK. We take that box. And next up that we've got is a YouTube documentary. So one of the things I've been able to do this year is record a, a documentary style. Imagine a Netflix documentary, whatever. It's, this is, but it's on YouTube because Netflix, I haven't got the money to put forward a, a premiere for, for Netflix. So we're doing it on our own land. We're doing it on the YouTube channel, the Boostly YouTube channel. Please do go and subscribe to it. And what we've done with the documentary is that I picked two hosts and the criteria was A, they couldn't be a Boostly client. B, they had to be at the start of their journey and C, they had to be up for being filmed nonstop. <laughs> and we picked one in America. We picked one in the UK. We just basically started in January and we finished wrapping filming just before uh, BPCon, which is the uh, middle of October. Hmm. And over the course of this year, we have taken all of the training from the, the playbook and all of the training from my other book, which is the blueprint, and we plugged it into their businesses. And then the result, which you'll see in the documentary, is that I thought and I assumed that the same results would come out the other end. They would go on the same journey and they'd come out the other end. I couldn't be further from the truth. They went in their own little journeys. We've done all of these cool things. But the main thing is now is that their businesses are set up to, to grow scale and, and beyond in 2024 and beyond. So yeah, that that is what we've been working on. It's going to be premiered on the 26th of December, around 8 p.m. UK time. I'm going to do a huge watch party on the Boostly YouTube channel. So go and subscribe, hit the notification bell so you'll get a notification when it's happening. And yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. All right. I will join you on that watch party. That sounds like a really fun, those in-depth where you follow along someone's journey, especially now if it's talking about business that you are in. Yeah. I'm excited. Thank Mark, you. where else can people find you? Instagram, at Boostly UK. So somebody got my handle Boostly back in the day. So it's Boostly UK. Hey, but come and join in. Send me a DM. It's the one channel that you can send a DM even if I don't follow you. So come and say that you check me out on the podcast. Any questions that you've got, if you want to link to the book or anything I've spoken about, yeah, come and say hi on there at Boostly UK. Awesome. And I'll also link all those books and your website as well down in the show description. But Mark, I appreciate you jumping on, sharing all of your wisdom about direct bookings, about your own entrepreneurship journey. I've actually learned a lot. And so I'm excited to dive in and learn a little bit more about your platform. So I appreciate you jumping on today, man. Thank you very much. All right, guys. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give this a like and subscribe. And don't forget to say hi to Mark, whether it be in the DMs or in the comments below. And I'll see you all in the next one. Cheers. Thank you very much. Love that. Lovely questions. Yeah.